we live on an Earth covered with oxygen. We take it for granted now, but oxygen wasn't always a part of the atmosphere. So little has survived from our pre-oxygenated Earth that how it appeared in the atmosphere remains one of the biggest planetary mysteries of all time. A team of researchers is working to solve the mystery of how and when our Earth got its oxygen. One of them is Greg Fournier. And really, we have only two records of uh, deep time on the planet and the changes that, that Earth has seen. And one of them is well known, it's the geological record. And the other is the record preserved within genes and genomes. Not only are these the only two records we have, but they're almost certainly the only two records we will ever have. These two records are incomplete. The rock record shows evidence of when oxygen began to build up in the atmosphere. This rock sample shows bands of rust that formed because of oxygen's chemical reaction with iron. But what these rocks don't tell us is where that oxygen came from in the first place. That answer lies in these vivid green bacteria, called cyanobacteria. Their ancestors were the first organisms to develop a special evolutionary ability, photosynthesis, that changed the world as we know it. Cyanobacteria are the very first organisms that figured out how to make oxygen. How to take water, which is really abundant everywhere on Earth, and use sunlight to split water and make oxygen. The question is when cyanobacteria really evolved and when they figured out how to make oxygen. Was it maybe half a billion years until we see oxygen in the atmosphere, starting from the evolution? Maybe it was really immediate, like five minutes, and then you have an oxygenated atmosphere. Ancient cyanobacteria left behind the oldest fossils on Earth, some dating back to 3.5 billion years ago. So what we are really interested in is modern cyanobacteria and how they relate to the the oldest cyanobacterial fossils. So how to use modern cyanobacteria, information in their genomes, information about their shapes, because they look quite, uh, well, some of them can be quite unique, and how to really trace back um, the, the evolution of these modern organisms to something that may have been happening two billion years ago or so. Fournier has a different approach. Instead of fossils, he looks at genes. The question that I'm most interested in is how can we use genes and genomes to examine and test what we can infer just from the rock record. Just like the genes of our ancestors make us who we are today, living cyanobacteria contain the genes of their ancient ancestors, and Fournier uses these modern cyanobacterial genes to trace back their lineage, like family trees. Fournier does this by examining the changes or mutations that accumulate over time. So as these mutations occur along a branch in the history of a group of, of, of living things, they accumulate. And so you can think of it like a clock. The more time that's passed, the more changes that are expected to happen. These are called molecular clocks. They're the most basic way to measure evolutionary changes over time. But it turns out, evolution plays tricks with time. Some genes don't get passed down in a straight line. Some organisms, including cyanobacteria, pass genetic information side to side, rather than inheriting genes directly from their parents. So their history is actually different from the history of the rest of the genome. And we call these horizontal gene transfers. One of the things that my lab is trying to do is to uh, use these horizontal gene transfers as a novel piece of information to understand the timing of the evolution of organisms. Building these family trees takes days on supercomputers. Once complete, they reveal the sequence of steps that allowed ancient microbes to make oxygen. But Fournier's molecular clocks tell relative, not absolute time. They can't say exactly when this all occurred. That's what BOSAC works on. And our approach is using fossils and modern genomes of organisms that we can relate to fossils, then to pin down certain events in time. 
So what we do is we sample modern organisms, we look at them, we choose the ones that really look most like some of the oldest fossils, and we grind them up, we extract their ge genomes, we sequence them and analyze them. And by that we get the time constraints on the cyanobacterial evolution. It would not have been possible to do this kind of integrative, to apply this integrated approach to the question of cyanobacterial evolution 10 years ago or 15 years ago before the advent of this cheap sequencing and massive amounts of genomic information that we can now use. Even with the genomic approach and the deep investigation of fossils, there will always be gaps in both the rock record and in the history of genes. But with the use of these new techniques, adding computational methods to the traditional geological methods, the hope is that enough will emerge to help us better understand how our Earth evolved over deep time. We can still discover major important truths about the history of the planet, even if we know we'll always have a few missing pieces. It's sort of like a puzzle that you might find up in the attic where it's missing maybe five or six pieces, but you're still pretty sure it's a horse. Fournier and Bosak's research helps establish how the Earth came to be, the place we inhabit today, one rich in oxygen and all the diversity of life. But that's not where this story ends. Really, understanding the past history of Earth shows us many different habitable worlds and many different ways that a living planet can look. And so if we're interested in detecting other worlds that may have life, and understanding maybe what the true diversity or abundance of life is in the universe, understanding the history of life on Earth is really the best direct set of examples we have. This research is important because we need to know how planets evolve and uh, how we came to be. If we want to understand why we exist, why we are here, what enabled complex animals to evolve, or how to even look for life elsewhere in the universe. We need to understand how a planet evolves or co-evolves with life on it. And this is the only example of a planet that did so.